Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 38 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Evan Hirsch, and the topic of the show is beating Bartonella. Dr. Evan, as he's affectionately known, is one of the nation's leaders and authorities on chronic fatigue. He suffered from chronic fatigue for five years until he achieved resolution using the protocols he pioneered in his medical practice. He's helped over a 1,000 people resolve their chronic fatigue and is now on a mission to help 100,000 more people through training of providers and creation of online content, including web articles, videos, and online courses. He has lectured nationally and internationally on topics in integrative and functional medicine and is board certified in family medicine and integrative medicine. When he's not at the office, you can find him singing barbershop, listening to musical theater, playing basketball, traveling, dancing hip-hop, and spending time with his family. His mentors include Jonathan Wright, Alan Gabby, Andrew Weil, Mark Hyman, Datis Karazian, Richard Horowitz, Jacob Teitelbaum, and Nicholas Hedberg. Dr. Evans' focus is on fatigue and autoimmune disorders. And now, my interview with Dr. Evan Hirsch. So I wrote an article with Ed Breitschwert and Dr. Robert Moisiani on Bartonella a couple of years ago for the Townsend Letter. And in my experience and opinion, Bartonella may be the most challenging Lyme-related infection that people really deal with, not only related to the symptoms that it creates, but also the challenges in treating it itself. So I'm excited to hear the latest on Bartonella today from Dr. Evan Hirsch. Welcome to the show, Dr. Evan. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So let's start first with what got you into exploring Bartonella. You're known for your work in the realm of chronic fatigue syndrome. How does Bartonella fit into the context of chronic fatigue? And then was Bartonella one of the issues that you personally faced as part of your own health recovery journey? Good question. So what I found on my path, you know, I had chronic fatigue for five years. I solved it. I've helped hundreds of people resolve theirs. And I, what I found was that there are 14 general causes of chronic fatigue, and one of them is infections. And so I actually never wanted to get into infections. I felt like it was too complicated, and there was all these side effects from all these antibiotics that people were using, these Lyme literate doctors. And, um, you know, I, I was like, okay, let's fix the immune system. Let's fix the gut. Let's um, take people, support them, you know, support the terrain, and that'll fix everything. And I just found that that didn't work, you know, and as I got better, I got sicker people. And then I had to get better and I had to get more tools. And so I had to step into the infection arena, which has just totally been amazing for my ability to help my patients. So on top of that infection list, Bartonella is just so incredibly common. And as we get into it, you know, it's, I think it's really ubiquitous. I think pretty much everybody has it. It's, um, it's crazy. And the question is just whether or not it's active and who else is involved that is causing the fatigue? I would absolutely agree. I think it is ubiquitous. I think it's a big, big problem. I think for people with Lyme, that Bartonella and Babesia uh, probably pay a larger role than Borrelia itself in most people, and so it's something definitely not to be overlooked. I'm wondering if you have any guess in terms of what percentage of people with Lyme do you think Bartonella also plays a role? And then you mentioned that it's a fairly common infection, but what about just general population in terms of exposure to Bartonella potentially? Maybe they don't even know that they have it or they're not sick, but do you think that it's the majority of the population? I do. You know, I I probably wouldn't say 100%, but I'd probably say 95, 99%. You know, we know 50% of all domestic animals have it you know, and who's, who has it nuzzled with their, their animal, you know, and then all the other transmitters, you know, fleas and ticks and mosquitoes and sexual transmission and vertical transmission from mother to child, which I see quite often. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's everywhere. So I would, I would definitely give it a high number. 
So let's get into ways that people are exposed. And you just touched on some of those, but what are some of the vectors that you think introduce people to Bartonella? And you mentioned <clears throat> vertical transmission. You also mentioned sexual transmission. So do you think that it's fairly likely that it is transmitted between people as well? I definitely do. You know, it's, it's challenging because we don't know who's been bitten by a flea or by a tick oftentimes. But, you know, people who haven't traveled to endemic areas who, or who don't acknowledge that they've ever had these sort of bites, you know, everybody's acknowledged a mosquito bite, you know. But it's, it's yeah, it's challenging. But I definitely see it running in families. And I'm really curious, especially when there's psychiatric illness or certain common things, everybody had burning foot pain, you know, that kind of goes throughout a family tree that really makes me think about, okay, dad gave it to mom, mom gave it to the kids. Um, it just seems very clear to me. But the other vectors, you know, anything that takes a blood meal. And so we're talking about fleas and chiggers and ticks and mosquitoes, biting flies, and, you know, even um, blood transfusions. So, you know, they're, they're not screening for Bartonella, you know, there's still just um, some infections that they're screening for, and I do not believe that Bartonella is one of them. So there's just so many ways that it can be transmitted. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Dr. Klinghart's been one of my mentors over the years, and talking more about Borrelia, he says that, you know, he really dislikes the idea of tick-borne illness because it's probably transmitted in many other ways. And he says, no longer is the question, have you been born, been bitten by a tick, but have you been bitten by you know, five mosquitoes over the course of your lifetime. I think in one study, they showed something like 20 or 22% of mosquitoes carried Borrelia, whether or not it's something that it can transmit or not, I think is still being researched and looked into, but it is certainly something that uh, there are many possible ways that we get exposed to these things. Mm -hmm. So once someone gets exposed, what do you find from a testing perspective? Are there particular labs you like to use? Is it difficult to get a positive result for Bartonella, even in someone that you suspect clinically may have it? It is. So I'm a big fan of treating by symptoms. You know, some of these infections are incredibly expressive. So, you know, there are certain characteristics that really are just going to be caused by Bartonella or just going to be caused by Borrelia. You know, the migra migratory arthralgias or the joint pain that moves around. There's not many things that do that. You know, that's really more of a Borrelia thing. You know, with the Babesia and some of the, the psych stuff and the sleep stuff and the sweating, you know, I mean, like this chronic sweating picture where people are like, oh, well, I'm sweating all the time. You know, that's a really big Babesia thing. And then the Bartonella with the pain, if they got the pain on the bottom of the feet, and we'll go into some of the other symptoms later, but like, it's really, it's really pathognomonic or diagnostic when you, when you see this constellation of symptoms. But if I do look, you know, I, I run a serology in my clinic. I don't think it's the best test, but it gives me some data. It doesn't pick up a lot of the uh, Bartonella. And so if I wanted to, if I needed more uh, assistance with that, I would go for a PCR test, whether it's a urinary test or a blood test. I think that those are going to be the best ones, but you do have to provoke them. So people do have to get rolfing or exercise really hard or get that lymph moving to try to mobilize all of those infections out of the tissues, out of the joints and skin and whatever, in order to get a good collection. Yeah, and I've heard that technique used with DNA connections, for example, is one that Dr. Klinghart uses. Are you familiar with that lab at all? Yes. And is, is that one that you use for Bartonella testing? Yes. Cool. Excellent. So it's interesting that, you know, we talked about the fact that many people carry these microbes. What makes the difference between someone that may carry these things but never have a symptom in their life and someone who carries these microbes and is bedridden and incredibly sick? What are some of the things that differentiate those two scenarios? Yeah. So I tell people that it's the number of hits that they get during their life. So you know, I believe people are born with all these infections. You know, we know we're 90% bug cells and 10% human cells, which always blows people's minds. But, you know, so let's say we're born with Bartonella. And then, you know, Bartonella is not going to express itself until you get a number of these hits. And these are stressors. So I call them the usual suspects. And these are heavy metals and chemicals and mold, other infections, allergies, emotions, EMFs you know, ACEs or basically childhood trauma, you know, so that some of the mental emotional stuff too. So the more stressful events, you have a car accident and then all of a sudden the person comes in and they're like, I've got burning on the bottom of my feet and these migraines, you know, and then nobody can tell me what's going on. But it was that accident that was kind of the final straw 
that disrupted the immune system. So the immune system couldn't keep the Bartonella or whatever infection it was in check. You know, the, the immune system and these infections, they've got a great relationship if it's working right. If it's not, then these infections become opportunistic. The immune system starts going crazy and you get a lot of inflammation, dysfunction, and symptoms. So as I understand it, one of the reasons that Bartonella creates such significant issues is because it creates inflammation in the small vessels and the blood vessels throughout the body. What are some of the symptoms that you commonly see with people that are expressing Bartonella? Yeah, so a, a better question probably is what symptoms can't Bart Bartonella cause, right? Okay. So any place where you have blood flow in small vessels, you're going to get lots of symptoms. So I like to start, you know, at the head and work down. So people may have fevers. Sometimes they're cyclical. Sometimes they're sweating at night. It's usually not as bad as Bartonella, but they may have some of that. Um, headaches, migraines, neck pain, sleep problems, anxiety, depression, thyroid issues. They'll have the, um, the striae, basically the, um, the stretch marks usually in weird places. They'll have muscle cramping. Oftentimes they'll have pain. They'll have like deep bone pain. So they'll, they'll say, I've got pain in my hands and my feet. For some reason, those are really common places. Sometimes they'll get zingers, electrical shocks, urinary symptoms, prostate issues. You know, I had prostatinia, which is kind of like pain in the prostate when I was in medical school. And looking back now, I think that was probably related to Bartonella. Um, and then the pain on the bottom of the feet, you know, which is incredibly characteristic. Burning, sometimes it's burning, sometimes it's just uncomfortable. They step out of bed, they walk around, their, their, their feet are more sensitive, they need to put on some shoes. So it's kind of like pain in the feet um, that can be a big problem. But those are, that's most of them. Yeah, when I first got really sick, and this is going back 20 years ago now, one of my most significant symptoms was this kind of full body burning sensations, but particularly in the feet, so much so that I couldn't even wear shoes or socks for quite a long time just because the pain of putting those on was was more than I was willing to endure. So one of the things that's interesting with Bartonella too is it seems a lot of people's symptoms are the mental, emotional type things. The anxiety is probably one of the biggest ones. The, the rages even, I hear people talk about Bartonella rages. And sometimes I wonder when you see these events in the news about you know the latest school shooting or something, you kind of wonder if they were to you know test that person for Bartonella, you know, is that also a factor in, in some of these things that are happening in the world? Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. So you talked about the um, stretch marks, and that's something that people, I wouldn't say that I see people talking commonly about it, but certainly when it's present, it's, it's a pretty good indication that Bartonella is probably in the picture. So when you see these, do they resolve with treatment? Do they completely go away, or do they just kind of lighten up and they generally persist for a longer period of time? What's kind of the course of, of those stretch marks? It depends. So for some people, they go away completely, and some of them, they lighten up, and some of them, they don't really. I mean, it really depends on, you know, where the Bartonella is most active. You know, it, it does live in the dermis, in the skin, as well as in the small blood vessels. So um, it depends on the person, and sometimes you have to remove more of the usual suspects in order to have more success against the Bartonella. But I don't use it as an absolute, like, oh, Bartonella is still here because you have those stretch marks. I'm, I'm usually looking at some more of the other symptoms that are more of a problem for the patient. Another thing that I see people talking about with co-infections is the cherry angiomas or the little red dots that you see on the skin. I've heard that those can be related to Babesia, but I've also heard some people talk about them in Bartonella as well. So how do you differentiate between Bartonella and Babesia specific skin manifestations? Um, well, honestly, I, I don't because I, I don't see the cherry angiomas as a huge problem or a huge symptom. I mean, I think they're definitely identifiable. And most of the time I see them in Bartonella. I'm not really looking for them in Babesia. So if they do show up, um, I may not be noticing them. But I really think that it's, you know, if someone has a whole bunch of Babesia symptoms and they got the cherry angiomas, they don't have any Bartonella symptoms, then I'm like, okay, that's Babesia. So I'd have to combine it with the other symptoms that people are having. Okay, that makes sense. Another thing with Bartonella that I hear some people talking about is kind of the nodules underneath the skin, maybe in the thighs, for example. So what are some places in the body where Bartonella might lead to these nodules? And then do they resolve as you treat Bartonella? Or is there something more local that may need to be done to address the specific nodules that are there? 
they generally resolve when I'm treating. Um, you know, it, it can take a while, you know, depending on all the other causes of fatigue and, and complicating factors. But generally, people will start to see them shrink. And it is because, and it, and it happens mostly in the dermis, mostly in the skin. Um, and the reason why is because Bartonella loves collagen and loves to live in the skin. And so that's, that's why you're going to get those nodules. Okay, perfect. One of the things that I heard you speak about recently was the connection between Bartonella and the thyroid. And that's not something that I've heard a lot of people talk about. You hear people talk about um, things like Hashimoto's and Epstein-Barr or Hashimoto's and metals or even Borrelia, but I haven't heard a lot of connection made between Bartonella and thyroid. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. And then as you treat Bartonella, do you see people's thyroid autoantibodies resolve? Yeah. So thanks for asking this question. I love talking about this because it just, you know, the serendipity of, of medicine and the art of medicine is just, uh, I, I just love it. So, you know, I had started to use some of the Byron White products. I had a patient who came in with Bartonella type symptoms. I, I started her on ABART. And after one drop, she messaged me, she came, she called, she came in and she was having all of these symptoms. Her heart was palpitating and she was tremoring and she had diarrhea and and I couldn't figure it out. I was like, why, why is this happening? This doesn't sound like typical die off. And I said to her, I said, when was the last time that you had these symptoms? And she said, when I had Graves. Now Graves is a hyperthyroid autoimmune condition. And so I said, okay, so you're hyperthyroid, maybe we should come down off your thyroid. So we decreased her by about 25 micrograms every time she had these symptoms and we were able to wean her off of her thyroid. And I've seen since then that people who have Bartonella symptoms and also thyroid issues, that about 80%, 70 or 80% of them, when we treat them with the ABART, we're able to get them off of their thyroid completely. So the question that I have is, are we treating Bartonella or are we treating something else? Because the beauty of the Byron White products is that they are herbs and they work on a number of different levels. So you've got antimicrobial activity, immune system activity, lymph activity, and then an energetic um, support ac activity as well. And so, um, and the main products that are in the ABAR are neem and grapefruit seed extract and poke root. And neem is a wonderful, broad spectrum, antimicrobial. I've spoken with some other physicians who say that you know, your cinea um, might be it. And I think that was Ty Vinson who said that, you know, who's yep. been on with you with the, his LDI stuff. I think he's found your cinea as a big cause of Hashimoto's. And so maybe the neem is taking care of that. But regardless, it's, it's working incredibly well. And so the way that I visualize it is that, um, like I do most autoimmune diseases, that the immune system is just doing its job. There's something in the tissue that's causing a problem. So the infection is inside the thyroid, which has an incredible blood supply, right? So that would make sense why Bartonella would be in there. And then the immune system is going to try to get rid of the Bartonella, right? It's going to gobble up foreign material. It's going to get it out of the body. But sometimes it has to go through tissue in order to do that. So it's damaging the thyroid as it's doing it. And consequently, you get some thyroid damage. You get low thyroid on its way to getting rid of the Bartonella. But that's that's the way that I see it, and that's been my experience with Bartonella, Abart, and low thyroid. That's pretty, pretty amazing, actually. I, I think that's exciting, because I don't hear people talk about that a lot. Do you see when people have had blood tests confirmed autoantibodies to the thyroid, and they start getting to the point they're able to get off their thyroid medication, do you see that those autoantibodies have also resolved? Yes. I do, but sometimes, you know, the, the blood antibodies really aren't a great test. You know, sometimes they're very accurate in somebody where they're high all the time, and sometimes it really depends on the time of day, you know, what else is going on with the immune system. So um, I, I test them, and I test them often, but I don't put a lot of credence into them. Now, if, um, if they're gone, if they're present and then they're gone, that's definitely reassuring. Yeah, that's compelling. I mean, it sounds like you have... 
uh, information that suggests that the autoimmune thyroid issue itself actually resolves, which when you talk to most people about autoimmune thyroid issues, they usually say, well, no, there's nothing that you can do to resolve it. You just have to take thyroid medication and, and deal with it essentially. So the fact that you're seeing resolution of that issue is pretty amazing. Another common issue that I hear people talk about quite a bit is heart palpitations. So do you see heart palpitations that are also related to Bartonella? And what are some of the places in the body? We talked a little about symptoms, but are there specific places in the body where you see Bartonella kind of concentrating in terms of the symptoms that it presents? Yeah, it seems like Bartonella loves muscles, you know, um, and it loves nerves. And so, you know, the, the palpitations may be due to the Bartonella being in, into the, in the heart muscle itself or into the AV or the PA node, you know, where it's, it's causing problems with transmission. But absolutely, you know, I see when I treat people for Bartonella, I see heart palpitations go away. You know, um, it's, it's wonderful and it's miraculous. But so nerves, muscles, um, the brain, obviously, with a lot of the brain symptoms, brain fog, uh, the prostate, for some reason, urinary tract. And so some of this, maybe it has to do with where there's collagen, you know, where there's, um, you know, and of course, the vasculature. So um, those are some of the big places that I see. So if you had to compare Bartonella to Babesia, would you say that Bartonella seems to be more of an issue for your patients than Babesia? Yes, absolutely. And Babesia is incredibly definable with, like I said, those symptoms mm -hmm. of sweating. And then they have really bad psychological issues. You know, I've had people come in here suicidal, and then we start treating the Babesia, and they get so much better. Um, so, yes, I would definitely say most that Bartonella is a... a I would say that it's it's more ubiquitous. Everybody has it, um, and I would say the Babesia might be easier to treat because once you identify it, I start treating it. Um, it goes away rather quickly. I had one guy come in here, new patient. He was coughing for several years. He was sweating, and um, and he had some psych issues going on. And I treated him for Babesia, and he said that you know he was better in just a couple of days. And so, oh, it was the shortness of breath too. And he was better in just like four or five days. And so it doesn't take a lot in order to treat the Babesia if you can identify it. And then I was using the Byron White products, which are incredibly effective. Yeah, you mentioned suicide. And unfortunately, that's one of the things I would say probably is maybe the most common thing in chronic Lyme that leads to somebody's death. And uh, oftentimes, I think if people had really explored the co-infections, that that is probably a big driver for the, the eventual suicide, that they haven't really looked at the Bartonella and Babesia. Um, and I know that I've lost some personal friends on this journey from, you know, Bartonella and Babesia suicides. And it's been, been an unfortunate thing. So anxiety, OCD, um, rages, depression, all of those neuropsych manifestations that seem very common with Bartonella. While you're treating the Bartonella, are there certain things that you also do to help people with? And I would say anxiety is probably the one that I see most commonly affecting people. So how do you manage the anxiety while you're working on the underlying causes? Absolutely. So I'll use some neurotransmitter support. I'll use GABA. I'll use some herbs, you know, theanine and some of these other things, you know, that can also help with sleep because oftentimes people are having sleep issues as well. Um, but I also find that, you know, the sooner I jump in and start treating the bug, the sooner they, they have improvement. And then, of course, you know, it's making sure that everything else is in balance because oftentimes when you've got these infections, it's messing with your hormones that can also increase anxiety and depression. Great. That's helpful. Are there certain products that you found helpful in the realm of treating Bartonella and possibly even some of the other Lyme-related infections besides the Byron White formulas, which you touched on? Well, most of the time I have really good success with the Byron White products, so I don't really need to go elsewhere. But when I do, I'm looking at neem and noni, grapefruit seed extract, poke root. Those are kind of the, the main ones that I'm going to use. Great. Yeah, those are great. And the Byron White formulas, I mean, I, I like them a lot as well. They're very, very powerful and, and potent tools. Um, so those are fantastic. What are some of the things that you find helpful for supporting the inflammation? So we know that Bartonella creates inflammation in the blood vessels and throughout the body. So what are some of your favorite anti-inflammatory strategies while you're also working through the Bartonella and other Lyme-related infections? So I'm a big fan of ginger and turmeric and boswellia and bromelain 
and pancreatic enzymes. And so I'll combine those in several different formulas that we use or give them individually to folks depending on what they've got going on. I'm moving into doing some more with uh, pulsed electromagnetic fields, which are really great for inflammation as well. Um, and that's actually the way that I reversed my Hashimoto's. So, um, so there's, there's a number of things that I'll use. So the PEMF, are you using like one of the mats or one of the ones that has the actual coil type systems or what kind of PEMF therapy are you looking at? The mat, so the Beamer, okay. which I've been using on myself for a while. Nice. Haven't done it a lot with patients, but I'm starting to implement it more in the clinic. And I think it makes a lot of sense, especially in Bartonella, because if you have the inflammation in the blood vessels, that's affecting the circulation as well, that microcirculation, right, which is one of the things that tools like the Beamer and similar products can really be helpful in improving. So, yeah, that's interesting. I haven't heard too many people talk about using that specifically in this realm, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, as you treat someone for Bartonella, I think it's common that they can have these die off reactions. So what are some of the things that you do to either support detoxification or other tools that you have for minimizing those detox or die off reactions as they're going through the therapy? So I have a list of about 20 things that I, I can take people through, but I can't emphasize enough how important it is for people to minimize their die off because you don't have to have a lot of die off in order to kill these infections. If you're able to open up the detoxification pathways and you're using small doses and increasing incrementally, you can have amazing results without draining all of your hormones and nutrients and and then you got to pick up the pieces at the end and that's when I get a lot of referrals is you know you've got Lyme literate doctors who are great, but sometimes they're so focused on the infections that sometimes they're destroying the hormones in the process. And then people come to me and their adrenals are in the toilet and they're like, well, my bug is gone, but I don't feel any better, you know? So um, it's so important. And so the tools that I like to use, the main one is with Byron White formulas, and that's their Detox One product, which has my favorite herb in there, which is Smilax or Sarsaparilla, which is a blood cleanser. And it is amazing. I started off using it first um, before I found out about the detox one product and it was my main go-to where, you know, um, it's a blood cleanser. So it's kind of cleaning up the crap that is being produced by the Yarish Herxheimer or the die off reaction where bugs are dying. They're releasing their crud into the bloodstream. And then the immune system is reacting with a cytokine storm and makes people feel like crap. So, um, so I really like the Smilax and then the detox one also has, dandelion root and milk thistle and some other supports for you know opening up the lymph getting things out of the lymph opening up the liver pathways the kidneys and really trying to flush things out and so what i do is i keep people at a two to one ratio or a three to one or sometimes a four to one ratio of detox one to abart or to whatever byron white formula that we're talking about. And if they're having die off, I just have them keep increasing the ratio. So they may be on one drop of ABART and they may have to be taking three, five, 10 drops of detox one, depending on how clogged they are. But I just keep upping it. If, you know, I try not to decrease the, um, the antimicrobial, if I don't have to, I'd rather increase the die off support. Um, and then I'll add in their detox too, which is more binders, activated charcoal. We'll use IVs, Myers cocktails, glutathione, um, detox baths with baking soda and magnesium or Epsom salt and hydrogen peroxide. You know, so there's a number of, of different tools, SEAC tea, coffee enemas, you know, those are all, those all can be incredibly helpful, but I, I can't emphasize enough, go slow. You know, if you're going to use these Byron White formulas, you have to, you know, one drop is incredibly powerful. If you're reacting to it, you have to increase the die off support. And even with my really sensitive patients, I will put drops on the bottom of the foot and they still get, they still get really good results, but they don't get a lot of the die off. I literally had spoken to one person that was using one of the Byron White uh, remedies, ultimately with, with good results, I believe, but um, initially had to keep it outside of her house because really it just created such a strong reaction. I mean, it's really, they're, they're powerful tools for sure. Um, it's interesting, the detoxification piece. So we talked earlier about how many people carry these infections and the difference between somebody who maybe manifests symptoms is 
the metals, the chemicals, the pesticides, all these toxins and things that we're exposed to. So um, my thought has always been that the detoxification piece of how you approach your recovery is also important for long-term maintenance of that good, healthy state. And so it sounds like not only are you implementing these things to help someone through the actual treatment, but you're also maybe addressing some of the underlying reasons that they manifested symptoms in the first place. Absolutely. And, you know, ideally, we would get rid of heavy metals, chemicals, molds, and uh, before we would ever go after infections. But sometimes that's not feasible. And who wants to wait six months if somebody's sitting in front of me and they've got Bartonella? You know what I mean? So they're going to have more success while we work on these other things. And so, you know, but I'll start them pretty quick with some Bartonella support. They can get feeling better. You know, that engenders trust. They understand. They know I know what I'm doing. They feel better. We're working on their adrenals and their thyroid, boosting them up. Their energy is better. They can do more in life. And then they can focus more on cleaning up, you know, their cosmetics and making sure they're eating organic and preparing their food better. And, you know, so it's really a negotiation. But yeah, ideally, we would get rid of all those things that have messed up the immune system in the first place that caused this infection to take hold. When someone has Borrelia and Bartonella, do you find that if you address the Bartonella that the Borrelia is either easier to treat or are there even some cases where it really doesn't even require a specific focus and the Bartonella really was the primary issue? Yeah, that's been really shocking for me is that, you know, when you get at these co-infections, you know, uh, I I work around the co-infections, you know, and, and work my way in towards Borrelia. Sometimes I never have to get to Borrelia. You know, it's like, oh, your migraine joint pain is now gone or, you know, your neuropathy is gone or, yeah, you know, and the question is, was that actually due to Bartonella or some of these other infections or was it, did you free the immune system up enough so that then it could help you go after Borrelia? Because, you know, if you don't have an intact immune system, you're not going to be successful going after these infections. Yeah, absolutely agree. Once we have Bartonella, do you think that we can fully eradicate it? Is that the goal of treatment? Or do you think that we still likely have some Bartonella in our system, but once we get it down to a certain level, then the immune system can manage it over a longer period of time? Yeah, it's really all about changing our relationship to it. So, you know, we've implemented LDI, low-dose immunotherapy in our practice, um, which has been great. And one of the things that I do before I give it to people is I kind of give it a little blessing and I, and I say, you know, may this be exactly what your body needs. May this change your immune system's relationship to the bug. Because I don't think, I mean, we're going to turn the volume down on the bug by using an antimicrobial, you know, like the ABART. But we also need to change this relationship to the immune system so that it can be friends. They can, I, 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 when I do this blessing, I say that they're, they're going to hug and they're going to kiss and they're going to dance together and they're going to have this symbiosis again because they really are friends and they really need each other. But something's happened, you know, they've got a schism in the family, you know, and, and they're really antagonistic siblings right now. And so we, we have to change that relationship as well. Cool. Yeah, that's fantastic. What do you think living in a moldy home does to someone that has Bartonella or Lyme and and co-infections in general? Do you think it's a big piece of the puzzle? Do you address that first? What do you think? Yeah, it's huge. Like you can't get better if you're living in a in a moldy place. You know, and and women are usually affected more so than men. So the husband sometimes not believing the wife that it's a problem, um, and you can't find it on the walls. I mean, mold is just so nebulous. And it is so important to rule out. It's just such a problem. And, you know, people can be exposed to mold when they're five. And then it's not a problem until, you know, it's triggered later on in life. And so, you know, a lot of times people can't put the the pieces together. But it's, yeah, I talk about this all the time in my book and my Facebook lives and stuff. Like, you have to get out of your home. And oftentimes you have to leave a whole bunch of your stuff in, so that you don't keep infecting yourself. Um, but it's a, it's a huge problem. Well, and it seems like a lot of the inflammation that people experience and also the immune dysregulation or confusion within the immune system is the result of all of those mold and water damage building toxins that we get exposed to every day. And for me personally, looking back now over many years of Lyme, I would say that the mold piece was probably a bigger issue and I just didn't know it at the time. And now having been through mold illness twice as well, um, I think it's a big, big part of the puzzle that people with Lyme should definitely explore very early in the process. I think they can cut a lot of time off and and a lot of years of struggle if they make sure that their environment is safe for them to recover. 
Yep. So. Absolutely. Why do you think that exercise or movement is important in recovering from something like Lyme or from Bartonella? I think a lot of it has to do with the lymph. So I'll tell my patients, you know, if you can't exercise because they're getting exercise intolerance, you know, it's draining their adrenals, I'll say jump, do jumping jacks. You know, I, I, I just find that that's really, really helpful for opening up those lymph pathways because these bugs love to hide in the lymph. And so, you know, whether it's biofilm or whether it's lymph, you know, you have to, you have to push them out and get them through. So that's, you know, and of course, exercise is the panacea, right? It's got more research on it than anything. And you, if you exercise, you're more likely to get rid of whatever ails you. I know there was a, a new study that just came out about jogging and running, about how running is the absolute best thing that you can possibly do for your body. I think it decreases or increases your lifespan by three years or something. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's just... It's just so important for the human frame. We're made to move. We have to move. And we've kind of been shoved into this society, unfortunately, where we're sitting at desks and we go from desk to car to home to couch, and we're not getting the movement that we really need. And most cultures, you know, have some sort of dance thing that they do in the evenings, um, you know, after work, a lot of the... Um, uh, Hispanic cultures, you know, and, and, and I really think we have to try to get back to doing something like that where movement becomes more a part of our culture. Yeah, I understand you're going to do an online training hip hop dance class for <laughs> us all. <laughs> that would be fun, actually. So let's talk a little bit more about the emotional uh, aspects. We know that emotions play a big role in these illnesses. So what are some of the tools that you find are helpful for your patients in terms of dealing with some of the mental emotional contributors to illness? Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of Holosync. It's something, it's a product that I use and that I recommend a lot to my patients. The challenges with it that I always have to um, give people a caveat is that it's going to be uncomfortable. This basically is something that you listen to in your ears every day, half an hour, hour, whatever you can. And it ends up, it'll, it changes your, your brain chemistry or your brain waves so that you're meditating like a monk who's been doing it for 30 years. And you can process through a lot of emotional stuff by doing this. Um, and I just get really great results with it, but it's really uncomfortable while you're going through it because you're kind of processing a lot of this. The other thing that I have is my wife in our clinic is a um, uh, personal development coach and she's amazing and, and we're going to be doing classes together and stuff and she wrote a chapter in my book and, and that's incredibly helpful where people are able to process through their stuff and it's, you know, we, we've started to look at ACEs or advanced childhood events as a vital sign. I heard a doctor talking about this the other day. I thought it was great. It really is a vital sign, you know, for the amount of trauma that people have really affects their overall health and chronic illnesses. You know, 80% of people who've had an, a higher ACEs number are more likely to have chronic fatigue. So it just plays a huge part of the overall picture. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I totally agree. It's significant. Have you had any um, experience using Annie Hopper's DNRS at all? No, I've, I've met Annie. I have not gone through her program, but that one and then the one by Gupta mm -hmm. are, you know, the amygdala retraining, I think is really great. And I'm, I'm definitely interested in them. One of the things that Stacy's starting to do is um, heart math, you know, so that's another tool that can be really helpful. Fantastic. Yeah, I like that you incorporate as a medical doctor that you incorporate this emotional mental work into your practice as well, because it's critical, and probably a piece that a lot of people need to explore if we didn't have some trauma or conflict that maybe set the stage in some way for illness, you go through something like Lyme, you get invalidated from, you know, doctor after doctor, that in and of itself creates a PTSD type event that I think people still have to then process, you know, the experience of their illness as well. So very important. You mentioned the Beamer, and I would say that that's one application of physics in terms of helping people recover. Are there other tools in the realm of physics that you also find helpful? I think that's the main one that we're looking at exploring. Um, can you give me some examples of some other ones? I may not be thinking of them. Uh, light therapy, uh, photon therapy, um, some of the mats, I think, the PEMF, I think those are fantastic tools as well. I know there's people that have other things like the AND, the ANDI is another tool that I know some practitioners use as well in the realm of physics. Um, but the PEMF, I think that's a, that's a pretty useful tool. Um, 
this probably won't be a popular question or answer, but why are cats potentially not a good idea for somebody recovering from chronic illness and how often do cats have Bartonella? Well, I'm going to be the bearer of good news, actually. Okay. So um, 50% of all domestic animals have Bartonella, 80% of all feral cats. But like I said, and maybe this is because I have a cat, everybody's <laughs> right. got Bartonella. And so is it really the fault of your domestic animal? I don't know. You know, I think that probably the pros outweigh the cons, but um, I, I, I think it's definitely that ha something that has to be looked at. Should people get rid of their pets? I mean, at this point, if they're watching your stuff, you know, they, <laughs> they probably have already been infected and, and they've got that cat. And I'm not sure, I would say stop kissing your cat on the mouth. That's probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, I'm not sure that you have to get rid of your animal at this point in time. But it's okay. yeah, it's a touchy subject for sure. Good. Well, I think people will actually like your answer, so that's good. <laughs> so if we step back a little bit and we look at chronic fatigue syndrome, there's so many people in the world that are struggling with it. What overlaps do you see with Lyme disease and chronic fatigue syndrome? And what are some of the other things that may be factors in your patients with chronic fatigue? Mm -hmm. So... Like I said, there's about 14 causes that I look at. Infections are one of them. You know, heavy metals, chemicals, molds, allergies, emotions, EMFs, um, hormone deficiencies, nutrient deficiencies, oxidative stress or oxidative deficiencies, not getting enough oxygen into the body, um, chemicals, pesticides. I mean, it's part of this whole picture, and it's really all about immune system dysfunction, immune system dysregulation, where these infections are supposed to be friends of ours. You know, they are, they're part of our microbiome, and then oftentimes that they get um, opportunistic when the immune system gets dysfunction from these other things. Now, does that mean that if you get a tick bite and you get Lyme that you're not more active to, you're a lot more likely to have a problem? No. You very well may be, but there are plenty of people who get bitten by a tick who don't have a problem. So, or at least there are, that number is decreasing, but it used to be that way. And so the question is, why is that? Why are some people affected more than other people? And it has to do with the amount of crap that you have in your body and how your immune system is functioning. Can it keep that Borrelia in check? So if we think about Lyme in the broader context of Lyme and co-infections, and then we look at chronic fatigue syndrome, are they really the same thing with two different names or are there some differences between those two conditions? Yeah, good question. So chronic fatigue syndrome is, is a symptom. So fatigue is a symptom. It's not actually a cause. Lyme is a cause and it's one of the multiples that I talked about, you know, and so it's really this combination of all of these different causes. I tell people you've got like 16 nails in the bottom of your foot. And if you pull out the Lyme, the Lyme nail, you probably won't get all the way better. You may have some symptom relief, but you have to pull out the gluten nail and the heavy metal nail and the chemical nail in addition to the Lyme nail in order to, you know, get yourself better. So it re you really have to look at all of the causes and fatigue really is just a symptom. And probably the five mold nails as well, because <laughs> it seems like that one's such a big deal. Yep. So yeah, that's a, that's a very helpful way to look at these conditions. So talk to us a little bit about your book. I know you have a book called Fix Your Fatigue. What's the book about? What kind of things will people learn? Why should we go check it out? Yeah. So I'm on a mission to help 100,000 people resolve their chronic fatigue. And so I dumped all of my protocols into this book. And from that book, I'm going to be also creating some online courses and um, hopefully do a summit one day and all sorts of stuff. But the book really is about identifying all of the causes. And so I just kind of go through, I tell people what labs to order, where they can get these labs if they don't have a physician that they're working with, what supplements to take, how to interpret the labs, how to make adjustments to the supplements. So, you know, it's really a, a tiered system where there's some people who are going to be able to get the book and go through it and fix their fatigue that way. And some people who are going to need additional support, come see me or my team at our clinic or um, take an online class. So it really depends, but I'm trying to help as many people as I can because I know what it's like to suffer with fatigue. It sucks. 
and it really messes with your life. And I just love seeing people get better from fatigue and how their world just kind of opens up and so much possibility and they're really able to live their passion and be the best version of themselves on this earth. Yeah, I totally agree. That's awesome. Uh, I think on Amazon, the book is available. I believe it's an ebook, right? Or is there also a print copy of it available? Print copy is coming. But right okay, now, good. Because right I remember looking last week and I'm like, oh, I kind of want the print copy. <laughs> so that's good. I'm excited. I'm a highlight kind of guy. So that's good. <laughs> so what are some of the key things that you do for your own health on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. So I start off in the mornings with the Holo sink, put them in my ears, um, meditate for about 30 minutes. I do some Tony Robbins tricks. So I do some breath work with some affirmations. And then I do some visioning you know, really seeing what I want to, my day to be, seeing, you know, if there's certain projects I'm working on, seeing them completed. Oftentimes I'm high-fiving my wife or my staff and being like, yeah, we did it, you know, so really envisioning those things. Um, and then I'm gluten-free, dairy-free, paleo. I'm pretty strict about those things. I don't have um, a lot of cravings. If I do want something sweet, you know, I'll go for maybe a little bit of chocolate, um, dark chocolate. Um, and then exercise. So, you know, I'll do jumping jacks in the morning. If I don't have a lot of time, I'm going to, um, I'm going to try to do that more in the evenings. I'll chase my daughter around or run around the block or, you know, try to get that in there. Um, and then going to bed at a reasonable time. So really focusing on these foundations of sleep and meditation. Um, and so I go to sleep at 10, 10 30. I find that if I miss that window, it's harder on me. And then, you know, I'm able to sleep for um, eight hours or so. And, and that's incredibly helpful for me. And then I take a load of supplements. So, you know, I'm supporting my adrenals, um, my, you know, my, my detox pathways. I've gone after infections. And so I'm definitely living, you know, what I preach. And I, I never ask a patient to do anything that I haven't done. You know, I'm definitely more of a modified food elimination kind of guy, you know, and so when I tell somebody they need to do a food elimination diet, I know what it's like, I know how hard it is. So those are kind of some of the things that I find incredibly helpful. And I'm starting to go to next tier stuff where I'm starting to think, you know, more doing more, um, more coaching, you know, with with my wife and, and starting to think more about, okay, how do I reverse engineer my life so that, you know, I am able to live my passion and help as many people as possible and and kind of remove myself from some of the things that constrain me you know the the mental slavery that i might be under so that i can live the best life that i can yeah that's awesome i love it when practitioners do the same things they ask of their patients unfortunately i see oftentimes practitioners are uh you know taking such care of their patients that they often kind of forget about themselves and and put themselves last and unfortunately that doesn't usually work out too well in the long run so it's great that you're doing all of those things if people are interested in working with you as a practitioner are you still taking patients how do they reach out to you and your staff yeah, we are still taking patients right now. And we are at the hirschcenter.com. So that's the Hirsch, H I R S C H Center, C E N T E R.com. And they can, you know, go through and they can have a, a free consult, phone consult with me where we could talk about whether we're a good fit. And then we have an initial visit. And then we would decide whether or not one of our programs is appropriate for them and how long that program might be. And um, so that we can resolve all of their medical issues. Awesome. That's great. I appreciate you taking time to be here today. This has been a really fun discussion. I think Bartonella is such a big player in this whole Lyme and co-infection realm. And so I think it's important for people to really consider it. I think we've covered everything from testing to treatment to symptoms to ways of, of transmission. So it's been a great discussion. I appreciate you for being here and thanks for all that you do. Thanks, Scott. It was Thank fun. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. To learn more about today's guest, visit thehirschcenter.com. Hirsch is spelled H-I-R-S-C-H. That's thehirschcenter.com. I appreciate your support of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter as Better Health Guy. The show can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. And if you'd like to be added to my newsletter, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. I'm looking forward to many more shows ahead and appreciate your interest. 
for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.